Hello, and today we're going to be talking about a little way that geometry can help us get a better grasp of uh, complex numbers. In this case, multiplicating them. Quick recap. What is a complex number and how do we multiply them? A complex number is basically just a real number, A, which is called the real part, plus another real number, B, it's called the imaginary part. This B isn't just by itself here, it's being multiplied by I. I is what we call the imaginary unit, and it's defined to be the root, square root, of minus 1. Why do we call it imaginary? Well, because it isn't real. There isn't a single real number such that it equals the square root of I. Why? Because I squared would need to be minus 1 and no real number times itself will give a negative result. Um, okay, how do I multiply them? I'm going to take an example here. Um, 1 plus i times 1 plus root 3 of i. change pen, that one was running out of ink. Uh, we just apply normal distributive rules as we would with reals, but there's one catch. i squared is equal to minus 1, and we should always treat it like that. So when we see i squared, we should write minus 1 and develop. So we're going to do the distributive here. Do here plus i plus i squared root of 3. i squared is minus 1, so we pass this over here. And we can't add these two terms, but I'm going to factor out the i so it's clear. What's the real part and what's the imaginary part? There. This is, a good, this is an example of multiplication where we know what the real and imaginary parts are because we literally just plug them in. But if we don't know, we can treat them as variables. And, try to, and we're going to use variables here to see if we can find a general rule for multiplying two complex numbers. So do the descriptive over here. Over here, we should find AC plus ADI plus BCI plus BDI squared. This I squared here is minus 1, so we should write this as minus BD. It's going to be AC minus BD. Factor out the I. I AD plus BC. So, for any complex, two complex numbers with real parts A and B, real and imaginary parts A and B and C and D, this is going to be exactly their, their product. This isn't a bad formula, but it isn't a good one either. It has good points and bad points. What's a good point about it? Um, it's easy to repeat. It's an easy formula. It has four multiplication and four multiplications, one subtraction and one addition. So if you want, this is really easy to tell like a, a computer um, using a language like Python how to do this. So if you want to crunch a hundred numbers that you know the real and imaginary part, you should use this. It's going to be quick, it's going to be efficient, it's going to be simple. But there is a con. This is, a, this, is when, this is an expression for when you don't know um, the real and imaginary part of either of these numbers. But these are just two numbers. This expression may look innocent now, but think about what would the expression be with three numbers. We need to plug this into itself and add the real and imaginary parts of the third number you're multiplying. This blows up really quickly. The fourth term, the fifth term, the sixth term, they're going to be huge. Uh, extremely big, um, complicated, hard to memorize, hard to generalize. 
But you might be thinking, okay, I see that this is going to be bad. You should actually try this out yourself to see what I mean. It's really horrendous. But why would I even need an expression for like 7, 8, 9 uh, multiplications? Well, the answer is equations. In equations, you never know what's the real and what's the imaginary part, because it's what you're trying to find out. For example, recently, I was trying to find the complex roots of a number, or being it, or better yet, which number that raised to the n would yield the number who, uh, that I'm rooting, which is z. Both of these are complex. Because this n here is actually a natural value, um, this is actually repeated multiplication. And ideally, what I, what I would do is figure out some big expression, um, big expression or any expression that gives me the real part and the imaginary part of this product here. And then I would equate that to the real part and the imaginary part of z. The problem is that this expression is going to be so huge that it's completely... It's impossible to use it. It would be too hard to equate. It just doesn't work. But thankfully, when you project um, these two complexes here onto a plane, a complex plane, and using a bit of geometry, it actually reveals something much more intimate about the, this formula here that you can't really see right now, just multiplying like this. So, uh, quick recap, what is a complex plane? A complex plane is just an XY to D Cartesian, whatever you prefer, plane, but with one difference that is actually pretty important. The x-axis is actually called the real axis and the imaginary axis is actually the y-axis. Why, why are we changing the names for the x and the y-axis? It all relates on how we take a complex number and we project it onto a point on that plane. We map it to a point on that plane. Basically, it's actually pretty self-explanatory. If you have a number a plus bi, which I'll call the algebraic version of a complex number, and you want to map it to some coordinate. Well, it makes sense that x is the real plane, right? So the x coordinate should be the real part of the complex number. And likewise, the imaginary part of the complex number should be the y coordinate. So now we successfully mapped a complex number onto a point. And what is this point? Exactly AB. Because A is the x-coordinate and is the real part, and B is the y-coordinate and is the imaginary part. So we've mapped A plus BI, this little arrow here, I'm calling it map, maps to AB, this coordinate over here. Knowing this, let's take our example over here and let's plot it have 1 plus i, which is going to map to 1, 1, which is here. We have 1 plus root 3 of i, which is going to map to 1 root 3. 1 root 3, approximately over here. This one is a bit complicated. It has 1 minus root 3 as its x-coordinate. 1 minus root 3. And for its y coordinate, it has 1 plus root 3, which is going to be approximately, approximately 2.7 over here. Take a ruler, write this down. There we go. Okay, um, of course, since the mapping between the complex number, the real and imaginary part, to the coordinate is so direct, so straightforward. Obviously, if we just look at the coordinates now, it's not going to make any difference from what we had earlier. We're still going to have this bulky expression that generates kind of randomly all over the place numbers, and overall it just won't work. So we need to check other things that are changing here. 
And notably, there's one thing over here that is doing something pretty interesting. Let's write these points here. And it's the angle. This angle here, um, this actually is a right triangle over here. The angle from this vector over here, this little arrow here, from the x-axis is actually 45 degrees. Because this is a right isosceles triangle. So this is 1, and this is 1. And this one here, if you remember this notable side length case, this is 1, this is root 3. And this actually forms, it's also a right triangle over here, this forms a 60 degree. And if we go over here and measure the angle of the third one, look what we'll get. Exactly 105 degrees, which is the sum of the other two. Now, that's pretty neat. Don't trust this example though. Go to a graphing calculator like GeoGebra, try some other examples, and you'll see that they all come to this result. But, it's not only the angles that are changing. I mean, you might notice that the length of this vector here, this complex number here, this length is also referred to as modulo. This modulo is actually related to the modulo of a real number because it's the distance of a complex number from 0, 0 here. So this length here, this length here. Notice that this length is noticeably different from the other two. So how is it changing? Well, we can actually compute the length of every single one of these by just using the Euclidean distance formula or Pythagorean theorem. You know that this one's going to be 1, 1, so it's 1 squared plus 1 squared, 2, root of 2, length. This one here is 1 squared plus root of 3 squared, which is 4, and take that root, and it's going to be 2. This one's a bit trickier, so we're going to do it over here by hand. We have 1 minus root of 3 squared plus 1 over 1 plus root of 3 squared. This is going to be 1 minus 2 root of 3 plus 3 plus 1 plus 2 root of 3 plus 3. These two cut. We're just left with 1 plus 3, 4 plus 1, 5 plus 3, 8. This is the square of our length. So we need to take the root of this and simplifying this root you're going to find exactly 2 root of 2 which is, magically, of course, the product of these two radiuses here. So, we can form by our experimental results that you, again, go to GeoGebra, confirm this with other examples until you're convinced. We can conjecture that the, uh, that the final angle is going to be the sum of the other two, and the final radius is going to be the product of the other two. So, if, the f if you consider the first radius or length, length is also called radius, um, the first one is going to be, let's consider it R1, the second one R2, and this one we're going to call it RP, because it's the length or radius of the product. And the angles we will call theta1, theta is a generic Greek letter really used to represent angles. Call the other one theta 2. The third one theta p because of product. We can conjecture the following. Theta p is equal to theta 1 plus theta 2 and that rp is going to be r1 times r2. This is the behavior that we've experimentally seen and we're conjecturing that it's true whenever you multiply any two complex numbers. But now, the motivation. Why does this happen? I mean, why does this effect happen? Because the only real by-the-book way we have of multiplying is using this formula. So what is this formula hiding in the backdrop that we aren't seeing and that creates this result?
Well, first, we need to introduce you to the polar form of representing a complex number. The polar form of representing a complex number, instead of taking like two coordinates, instead of taking like two coordinates and uh, making a point out of it, we take instead a radius, a length, and an angle to build it. So essentially we're mapping a radius and an angle is equivalent to this little vector here. Pretty neat. So what we want to do is since we want to try out what happens, what's happening in the backdrop here, it would be nice if we found some algebraic a plus bi way to represent a complex number based on its radius and its angle so that we can do the multiplication here and figure out what is going on over here that's different when we do this this way so what do we want to do? we want to take r theta and map it to some a plus bi how do we do this? well, there is something we could do that's pretty interesting r theta is a geometric thing Coordinates are a geometric thing. If we can map r theta, which is a geometric thing, to our coordinate, which is also a geometric thing, this should not be too difficult, we can already map this. We already know how to map this to a plus b r. It's literally just copy and pasting the, the real, the coordinates into the real and imaginary parts. So if we can show how we can map this to this, it's obvious we can map this to this and therefore we have our mapping that we wanted from the beginning okay now how do we map um, a radius and an angle to a coordinate well let's draw the little vector here oh, arrow radius r well, what do we want to find? We want to find the y and the x component. Let's draw them here. y, the x. Using the trigonometry we were using earlier, you might remember this is the x here, I forgot. Um, we know, because this is a right triangle, we know that we can relate this x and y to this r and theta using trigonometry sines and cosines. So basically, the cosine of theta is x over r, and the sine of theta is y over r. If you pass the r to the other side, you will have that r cosine theta is equal to x, and that r sine theta is equal to y. So we successfully mapped um, two of uh, our radius and angle, length and angle, to our coordinates. And this is actually, and to map this to an uh, algebraic version is really simple. Just take the x coordinate plus i times the y coordinate. So let's write down what we managed to do. R theta maps to R cosine theta, R sine of theta, which then maps to x component plus i times y, r sine theta. And therefore, we can just map, lo and behold, radius and angle to length and angle to this, an algebraic version. I'm going to factor out the r here, because factoring out thing is pretty neat. I sine theta. This is a really nice expression for this in the algebraic world. Now we are going to multiply both of these to see, well, what's going on here that we're missing and figure out why does this effect happen and hopefully prove it. So let's use the variables we were using earlier uh, for the multiplication. So the original radius length um, was r1, the second one was r2, and the first angle was theta1, and the second was theta2. So, let's write this down. 
write an algebraic version r1 cosine of theta 1 plus i sine of theta 1 times r2 cosine of theta 2 plus i sine of theta 2 uh, multiplication is still distributive and associative with this type of with this definition under complex numbers so what that means is we can just pass the r's to the left and expand this on the right so r1 times r2 times this thing it's going to be cosine the first one times cosine the second one plus do the distributive here plus i sine of theta 2 plus, no, times, sorry, cosine of the first. It's going to get big, so I'm going to write it down here. Plus, let's see, i sine the first one, cosine theta 2, plus i squared sine theta 1 sine theta 2 and this over here now some of you may already see where this is going it's going to be r1 times r2 you're going to group all the reals and all the stuff with i to the right so cosine theta 1 cosine theta 2 minus sine theta 1 sine theta 2 plus i factor out the i sine theta 2 times cosine theta 1 plus sine theta 1 cosine theta 2 now we're going to use trigonometry again you might recognize these expressions here. They're actually the sum. They're the cosine sum formula. And the sine addition formula. So we're going to rewrite this. We're going to be left with R1 times r2 times cosine theta 1 plus theta 2 plus i sine theta 1 plus theta 2. And now if we compare to algebraic version, you'll see that this here, that's outside of this cosine plus sine, is actually our radius, rp, of the final thing. And this angle here, and this thing, the, what's the argument to the cosine and the sines, are our final angle, theta p. Now we've reached this really nice result. We were able to prove this and figure out why it was happening. You see, we had every indication here. We had the subtraction, we had the addition, we had the right uh, order of the real and imaginary parts. But the thing is, we didn't see the cosines and sines that were in here. They were begging to be seen, but we couldn't. Why? Because we didn't factor out the radius. Factoring out the radius, we could see the sines and cosines. And they were really wanting to add, compact, using their addition formulas. So, by factoring, only factoring out these radiuses, we managed to get a completely different result that grows in a very much controlled manner. Because, for example, uh, like I said earlier, with 3, just add a theta 3 here. With, with and a times R3 here. 4, theta 4, R4. Simple, controlled, good, um, generic, etc. And this all happened just because we didn't factor out the radiuses. That's the only reason why this formula isn't this one. Um, and that little push of factoring out the radiuses, thinking of this angle summing and radius product thing, 
we, the only reason we could actually get to it, think about it, was doing a geometric representation. That's why having a geometric point of view in a, a lot of problems is a really helpful insight to figure out what you're doing and figure out patterns in general in things. This is a really good example of that. Um, another really cool thing that you might... It's a bit more advanced, but if you remember it, it's worth it. Um, Euler's formula. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but I really don't know another way. Um, what is Euler's formula? Uh, e. e. E is that number that is approximately 2.7. To the i, theta, theta is the angle, is equal to the cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. So if you recognize this expression here, it's because of this. So instead of writing this every single time, we can just summarize all of this into just saying, well, r1 over here, r1 e to the i theta 1 times r2 e to the i theta 2 is equal to r1 r2 e to the i theta 1 plus theta 2 theta 2 and this is really neat because besides all the sines addition and cosine addition stuff and the only reason why this is not this is because we didn't factor out the radiuses and we got that little nudge from geometry this actually <laughs> is almost trivially uh, an extension of the one of the first rules you learn with exponentiation. If you have the same base and multiply it with different exponents, this is just a to the x plus y. You just sum the exponents. It's simple. This is exactly what happen what's happening here. We're multiplying the radiuses because we have to, but the sign and angle adding thing that we did here is just literally summing this i theta 1 plus i theta 2 using this rule but instead of being real it has an i that's the only difference so also using this other piece of notation we managed to find or figure out a little proof or an extension of this rule here and it's, it's nice to have. It's nice, it figure it makes a nice expression. Um, another thing, the exponentiation thing. Let's go back on that. Um, when you... If you wanted to... The number that we're multiplying over here, um, over here, is the same. So the radius is the same, and the angle is the same. So when you do this n times, Already it said, when you, you're going to do like 3, you add 3. When you're going to do 4, you add 4. So when you're going to add n times, so when you're going to do n times products, n numbers, you add n times. And because um, this is all going to be the same angle, because it's the same number, you know that theta times theta times theta times theta, repeated addition, is just multiplication. So the resulting angle the product is just going to be n times the original angle for x and the remaining uh, the re radius of the product is just going to be well every radius radius times radius times radius times radius and repeated multipli repeated multiplication is just exponentiation so rp is just r to the n but this is real exponentiation and so it's easier so using our formula here from before we know that x to the n is conveniently packed up into r to the n e to the i n theta, which is a really small, really elegant, really powerful way to represent this. And I encourage you, try to solve this. You go to Wolfram Alpha, try some solutions out. It's actually really cool the way that the solutions pan out. They kind of walk a circle. Uh, try doing it. It's really fun. Um, I think that's it. Thank you very much for watching.